In September 1975, a devout follower of mass murderer Charles Manson aimed a Colt 45 caliber handgun at President Gerald Ford. The gun didn't fire, but 17 days later, a bullet was fired at Ford, who narrowly escaped assassination in another city. Join Jeff on this episode of History Hunters as he visits the Sacramento location where Squeaky Fromm gave Ford and his Secret Servicemen the scare of their lives. He'll also check out the San Francisco Hotel where Sarah J. Moore nearly shot the president. Today I'm in Sacramento, California at the state capitol where we're going to talk about a historical event that happened back here in 1975. It was the assassination attempt on the life of President Gerald Ford. A number of presidents have been here. On September 17, 1964, President Johnson delivered an address on the west steps of the capitol touting America's strength despite domestic unrest over the war in Vietnam. President Reagan had a rally out in the front here. In fact, Ronald Reagan was governor here in the 70s. Rebuild and be strong again to be prepared for peace. And I know that President Theodore Roosevelt was here. He delivered a speech in the back of this building, which has been covered up with a new building. It was on the morning of September 5th, 1975, that President Ford came here and he was going to meet with California Governor Jerry Brown. That was during Brown's first term in office. And he spent the night across the street at one of these luxury hotels. That morning, President Ford walked across the street. He had a number of onlookers who were trying to get a glimpse of him as he walked over here to the state capitol. When he entered the grounds, there was a woman waiting for him with a gun. I know the general area of where the assassination uh, attempt took place, but I'm going to try to find the exact tree that Squeaky Frome was detained under. Homeless people throughout the park. He walked across the street to this area behind me. The most direct route into the governor's office was along this walkway where a crowd had gathered to greet the president. President Ford walked up this sidewalk here. There's a seal of the state of California on these crash posts. Our post 9-11 society, these kind of measures have to be taken to prevent uh, acts of terrorism here. I wouldn't rule out somebody trying to attack California. So as President Ford was walking up into the Capitol, right about here is where Squeaky Frome, a member of the Manson family, uh, pulled out a gun and apparently she said later that she did not intend to shoot the president. She wanted to make a statement that would draw attention to her environmental causes. As I stopped, I saw a hand come through the crowd in the first row and that was the only uh, active gesture that I saw, but in the hand was a weapon. If you can see that lamppost behind me, it's the same one in this picture here of them running President Ford to security. Uh, Squeaky Frome was actually detained underneath this magnolia tree here. She kept saying it didn't go off, it didn't go off, as if that were to matter. Capitol Park, which began in 1860, is filled with 215 variety of trees, including some which originated in other parts of the world. It has changed quite a bit since 75. And from there, they ran, the Secret Service ran President Ford into the back of this building. Turns out there was really no threat that day because apparently there were no clips in the in the chambers, so the 
gun wouldn't have fired. As soon as the Secret Service saw the gun, one of the agents put the skin between his thumb and his index finger in the hammer to prevent it from firing. And I understand that he was cut from that. That agent was Larry Buendorf, seen here later in the day guarding the president at McClellan Air Force Base. Lynette Squeaky Frome, then 26, was a disciple of Charles Manson and a well-known figure in California. She had been nicknamed Red by Manson because of her red hair color and to represent the Redwoods growing in California. Following the incident, many marveled at how nobody on the security team had flagged Frome's strange appearance wearing her Little Red Riding Hood outfit. Frome's roommate at the time, Manson follower Sandra Good, said that both were members of the International People's Court, which she also termed the Court of Retribution, and that the court had an objective of killing polluters of air and water. Miss Good said, I'm warning these people they'd better stop polluting or they're going to die. Can you tell us directly your reaction to what Lynette has done? I'm surprised, but I don't judge her. I don't judge her one way or the other. If she thinks she did, if she felt that she did something, uh, that was necessary, then I'm with her. Um, it's up to her how she feels about it. If she regrets it, then I regret it. But I think she did what she felt was necessary to do. When President Roosevelt was here, this was not here. President Theodore Roosevelt delivered a speech in the back of the Capitol in, I believe, 1903. At the same time that he visited Yosemite, but you cannot see the actual spot where Roosevelt gave that speech because it's now covered by other buildings. This is how the east side of the Capitol appeared in the 1940s when Governor Earl Warren gathered with police and security staff for this photo. The annex was finished in 1952. There you have it. Squeaky Frome was actually sentenced to life in prison for attempting to murder the president, but she's been released and she's now a private citizen. President Ford, of course, passed away several years ago. The same month, September of 75, President Ford's life was threatened once again, probably in a more serious way, in San Francisco, when Sarah Jane Moore took a shot at the president as he exited the St. Francis Hotel. Oh my God, oh my God, there's been a shot. So I'm on Post Street in San Francisco, and right across the street there is the St. Francis Hotel. So I'm standing approximately where Sarah Jane War stood when she shot at President Ford on September 22nd, 1975. Across the street, Ford was coming out of that uh, building right there. Ford was at the St. Francis Hotel to deliver a speech to the World Affairs Council. Ex-Marine Oliver Sipple saw the gun appear and then fire, and immediately forced Sarah Jane Moore's hand to the ground to prevent her from firing more shots. In doing so, he became a national hero. President Ford came through the doors right behind me, walked out to the limousine on the curb. That's when the shot rang out. And right across the street over there by that side over there across the street is where Sarah Jane Moore was standing. Oliver Sipple knocked her hand. That's the one regret I have, that it was not successful. But right above the ATM machine is the bullet hole. I'm going to try to freeze frame it and point an arrow to it. But that is the, for the bullet head. It's said that Sarah Jane Moore's sights were off by six inches. And that's why she missed President Ford. It's a gun that she wasn't familiar with. But yeah, pretty cool that the bullet hole is still up there on the face of this hotel, right above the Bank of America ATM. It's amazing to think that that hotel back there still bears the scars from that shooting so many years ago, well over 40 years ago. It could have well been a national tragedy had Sarah Jane Moore actually hit the president. Like from Sarah Jane Moore provided a kooky explanation for attempting to kill the president. In 2007, she was released on parole and was interviewed by CNN. What drove you to want to try to assassinate President Ford? Well, everybody asks that, and the thing is that everybody was talking about it. They say, where did you get the idea? I don't know about the rest of the country, but in San Francisco, uh, people were saying this all the time. N number one, we elect our presidents, we don't appoint them. And Gerald Ford was appointed, and he was appointed by 
a crook, if you will pardon the expression. Unwanted publicity about his role in thwarting the would-be assassin caused grief for Oliver Sippel, an ex-Marine who served in Vietnam. The aim deflected by an ex-Marine, a Vietnam veteran named Oliver Sippel. A newfound American hero, over exuberant newspapers revealed to the world and his family that Sippel was gay. Celebrated gay supervisor Harvey Milk leaked the news about Sybil to columnist Herb Kane in the belief that the story would break stereotypes that all gays were limp-wristed sissies. Sybil asked that the newspapers not publish information about him being gay, but they were eager to do so anyway. My sexual orientation has nothing at all to do with saving the president's life, just as the color of my eyes or my race has nothing to do with what happened in front of the St. Francis Hotel. He filed a $15 million lawsuit naming seven newspapers, accusing them all of violating his privacy. But the cases were dismissed. Because of the unwanted publicity, Sippel became estranged from his family, who were harassed by the press and others. He eventually reconciled with his family, but at times expressed regret about ever having intervened on that day in 1975. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oliver Sipple's heavy drinking caused his physical and mental health to deteriorate. In February 1989, Sipple was found deceased in bed with a half gallon bottle of bourbon at his side. He had been dead for two weeks. September 1975 could have turned out very differently for our nation, becoming as dark a blot in American history as November 1963. Either San Francisco or Sacramento would have shared the dark stain of Dallas as the cities where presidents are killed. In Sacramento, this majestic symbol of state government would have become as infamous a historic site as Dealey Plaza. Fortunately, these stone figures didn't witness a president's murder that day. 